right, guys. Welcome back. Episode 26. Mm-hmm. I don't, we don't got no round for 26. No, 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 no. but uh, <laughs> you know, that's it's, crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, 26 weeks in, and this is a very, very special episode yeah. for us. Um, we got my guy Ash Cash here. Appreciate y'all, man. Thank you for having me. Oh, nah, yeah, nah. Sure. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank sure. you for coming. Yeah. So we're gonna give the background on, on Ash, but before that, we gotta give a shout out to Atlanta. That's where you live right now, yeah, right? ATL. Yeah, that's 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 home now. Yeah. Well, well, I'm always from Harlem, though. We gotta make that clear. Like yeah. I live in Atlanta, but I'm always from Harlem. <laughs> Born and raised. When you Saint in, Nicholas Projects. I, like when you walked in, I said Harlem's own. Facts. facts. <laughs> yes. Uptown, Uptown vibes. Yes, sir. Shout so, out um, yeah, Atlanta. Real quick, we we doing an event. By the time you guys hear this, it'll be last minute, but it's still time to register. We doing an event on the eighteenth. Free networking meet and greet is gonna be super dope. Yeah. Um, we bringing some of our EYL alumni with us, and um, we wanted to bring the whole city out. We are gonna do it real, real big. I'm so excited. Come to our, go to our website, the events tab, um, and register. Like I said, you guys got a day, a day and a half by the time you actually hear this, but. We are looking forward. To, it's always good to, to get to Atlanta. Brooklyn was great, but we here in Atlanta is right at the top. That's what they saying. Atlanta's like Wakanda, though. For sure. Like the, for sure. For sure. The Atlanta love is different. You know what I mean? They That's the they, Mecca. They That's the Mecca right, right sure, now, man. Sure. So, so Atlanta, we coming. All right. But right now, we have very important information, right? So, Ashcast, you actually has a very interesting story. I just learned some stuff, actually, that I didn't know before. So, yeah. we're going to talk about that. But he's a financial motivator. Right, he's an author, he is a speaker, he's a wealth coach, and he has a credit repair business. Mm-hmm. Anything else? I'm, I'm left out. Wait, uh, we, we forgot father. My father. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the most important. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, I think that I think that's that pretty much sums it. All right. So yeah, we this is gonna be a dope discussion. And so we're gonna talk about a lot of different things. Um, entrepreneurship, how to get into the author game, speaking. Um, but first, I want to kind of highlight your journey yeah. of how you got here because it's really interesting. So I'll let you tell it, yeah, yeah. but I'll give a quick overview. So you used to be in, so I'm in the financial services mm-hmm. industry. You used to be in the financial services industry as well. You still are in the financial services industry, but you used to be on the institutional side, That's right? True. And then you switched over to the entrepreneurial side of doing your own thing, right? So can you just explain that process? Because I think that a lot of times people, one of the biggest um, fears mm-hmm. to stop people from becoming entrepreneurs is... They lack faith. Yep. They lack faith and to say, okay, I have a secure job. It's difficult to leave something that's secure for something that's unknown. For sure. Yeah, right? We and even yeah. you, we spoke about that. You you kind of battled with that for a while. Sure. And then you was like, you know what? Enough is enough. I need to make this jump. So can you can you talk about that journey from yeah. working on the institutional side to to jumping off and just doing your own thing? Yeah, not for sure. So I, like I started my career... Uh, straight out of high school. So I was 19 years old when I started working at the bank. I did everything, teller, personal banker, private banker, branch manager, was the CEO of a credit union. Um, and for me, I kind of, I mean, I've always sort of like been a hustler. Like I always knew that I didn't want people to tell me what to do and things of that nature. Like I wanted uh, to be an entrepreneur. But like you said, that security is what kept me in the game as, as long as I was in the game. Um, but for me, that transition, uh, it, it, it is difficult though, right? It is that, that up and down because I know I remember, you know, I, I retired from banking when I was 30 years old, Key word, retired. right? Retired, <laughs> right? I threw, you know, I even threw myself a, a, a party, a retirement party at 40, 40 club, right? I was just about to turn 30. Um, and you know, I was, I was making money, right? I was making six figures at the bank, wound up quitting, becoming an entrepreneur, um, I almost fell on my face though, right? To be to be honest, right? I almost got to a space where, you know, I wasn't making as much money because I was used to that lifestyle. And so I had to go back into the working world, figure some things out. And then now I was like, all right, now I'm gonna jump back back in there. Um, and so partly uh, what worked for me was being able to create that multiple streams of income. And that's why I tell people that uh, whatever you do, make sure that you're not only relying on one source of income because having multiple streams of income was what allowed me to say, okay, you know what? Now I could jump out and be comfortable. Uh, but being on the institutional side, it was, it was tough, right? Because, um, I mean, you know, as being a licensed financial uh, advisor, um, there's certain things that you like you're highly regulated, right? And so, you know, when, you know, even when I wrote my first book, Mind Right, Money Right, um, so my real name is Ash Exantis, right? And the reason why I write under Ash Cash was because back in 2009, when I wanted to write my first book, Mind Right, Money Right, 10 Laws of Financial Freedom, I needed to ask permission from 
you know, from the institution to see whether I could write the book because I was a licensed rep with them. It was a conflict of interest and they weren't, they wouldn't let me write the book. Right. And so ask for forgiveness, not for permission. So I decided, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write this book under Ash Cash. If they find out, they find out, but I'll be Ash Exances from nine to five and I'll be Ash Cash, you know, every other, uh, every other time. Um, and that worked to me because I was building both simultaneously to the point where Ash Cash got hot enough where I was able to leave my nine to five and, and, you know, create some, some income by doing and that. And that's something that I always encourage people to do as well is where you don't have to do all at the same time, right. right? Everything at the same time. So you can still work a regular job while building up your entrepreneurial business. And then when that gets to a point where it can support you, then you take the leap. Right. right? Like, like people, I, I don't know where this anti nine to five thing come from. Like stop watching social media. If they lying. <laughs> no, I, yo, you know, fact, how many, you know how many people who out, who's, who's out here acting like they independent and then you bump into them at they nine to five and they, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, what's up, bro? Right. Like, stop listening to them. It's, it's like, it's a lie. Yeah. Like, your job is your investor. Yeah. It is your first investor. You quit your job. So, 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 so the reason why, so, my, so I have a company called Mind Right Money Management. The reason why it's Mind Right Money Management, because it's a mindset first. Money is mindset. Yeah. If you don't have the proper mindset, I don't care if you make $100,000, a $1 million dollars. $10 million. If you don't have the proper mindset, you're still going to be broke, right? And what people don't realize is that that, that if you have to struggle, the, the, the brain space that it takes for you to be creative, you're not going to be as creative. Your entrepreneurship venture is not going to be as successful as it could be had you had the proper brain space to not have to focus on the basics. So I tell people, listen, keep your nine to five. It, it, is, it is your first investor. Yeah. It is investing in your business. It removes you having to think about the basics, where I'm going to live, how I'm going to eat, and then the rest is how you invest your time, period. That, well, the, 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 well the, the, key, the key to that is that you have to be willing to put in overtime. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. When yeah. I say overtime, yeah. not overtime at your job, Overtime as far as to say, okay, I work from nine to five, yep. from six o'clock to eleven o'clock at night. Not a lot of people are willing to do that. Right. Yeah. That's it's, the thing that and we we talk about the social media it's thing. It's crazy. It's like that's what stops a lot of people is to say, okay, I can still work a job, but I'm gonna work another job right. that I'm not gonna get paid for. Yeah. Right. Because you you're entrepreneurial, the first year, first two years, first five years, right. whatever, you might work the same nine to five on the night end yep. and not get a dollar for yep. it. Yeah. That's a sacrifice that a lot of people's not willing to make. But let me ask you this, because I wanted to um you, you all right. So you said that one position in general um kind of changed your whole way of thinking, right? Yeah. Well you you the CEO of a credit union. Of a credit union, yep. In Queensbridge, right? Queensbridge projects. Yeah. So all right, so Queensbridge is the largest projects in North America for anybody's not familiar. Also home to hip hop royalty. Yes. Nas and yes. Uh Mob, Mob D, D Breast and Beast Project. Um yeah, Ron Artest. Capone, Ron Ron Artest. Yeah, Ron yeah, yeah. Uh Quamega. Yeah. A bunch of people. They ran Queensbridge in the 90s, late 90s. MC Shan, don't forget them. We got to no, go all the way back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't forget MC Shan, but we can't fit. I was just having this debate about like rap, right? And in the 90s, it was like Queens, they, the borough just was nah, unstoppable. Not. It was a resurgence. <laughs> it was a resurgence. <laughs> I don't know. And it's like Queensbridge and specifically, if you think about it, like for one project to have that much talent come right. out of it, it's crazy, but it's 96 buildings. 96. Yeah. So they had their own credit union in yeah. the projects, right? Yeah. yeah so uh, Urban Upbound is a nonprofit that provided services uh, within that that area. Um, and so Bishop Taylor, the, the, the CEO of the uh, nonprofit, decided that he wanted to open up a credit union to serve those members. Um, and so, you know, we had a mutual friend when I was working at Citibank at the time. We had a mutual friend. Um, and he was like, listen, you're the perfect person, right? You grew up in the projects. You're a VP at a bank. You understand our people, but you also understand how to run a branch from, you know, P&Ls and all that stuff. And so he tapped me and was like, listen, I want you to run this credit union. Um, and so I was 31 at the time. And so at the time, I was one of the youngest CEOs of a federally chartered bank. Um, and that really kind of changed my perspective on just what we need 
you know, from a, from a from a financial education perspective, because yeah. um, a couple of things I realized is that when I was working at Citibank in the same type of environment, right? I was running a $45 million branch right on 144th Street and 7th Avenue in, in Harlem, uh, same demographic, public housing, it was you know low income. Um, but because we had the capital, we were able to provide the the, the products and services that the that the uh, that, that they needed. Um, working at the credit union, I, I realized that, yeah, you know, Jay said this, right? He says, I can't help the poor if I'm one of them. Yeah. So I got rich and gave back to so me. That's, that's the win-win. Win. I didn't understand that until I became the CEO of a credit union and yeah. realized that in order to help them, one, it, it, we needed to, to educate them first because they were so used to using check cashing places and giving their money away that, that there was an education part first. But then there was a capital thing as well, right? Meaning that a lot of people were going to the check cashing places, were going to the pawn shops, were taking payday loans, were doing all of those things because they needed access, right? I, as a CEO of a credit union, could not give them access because there's a balance between, between taking risk as a as an institution, right? And so, let's say, for instance, I had two million dollars in deposits. That means, you know, th there's a there's a reserve, right? I can't lend up to two million dollars. I have to, you know, keep a reserve. And so, let's say I can lend one point two million dollars. But now I have to look at the risk. Like like as a credit union, the people who put their money in own the credit union, right? You're owner of the credit union. But I can't lend five thousand dollars to somebody who. Uh, has not demonstrated that they will be able to pay it back, even though I know that that they need it and that, that I can help. And so uh, it made me realize that, um, yes, access to capital is important, is is very, very important, but that financial education piece yeah. is, is more important uh, because, again, we've seen people who uh, come from places who they don't have any money. You give them money, they will lose the money. They will right. go back to square one because they haven't changed their mindset. They haven't, you know, recalibrated. Um, and that's what changed my life. I said, you know what? I have to be on a mission, not only locally, right? So, so prior to that, you know, I was working in Harlem. I was working downtown. I was working in Queensbridge. But I said, on a national level, I want to reach people. Um, and that's why I continue to write books. That's why, you know, I started to, to reach out and, and, and become a national voice for financial education because our people, most importantly, have been, been, been shut out, right? Shut out of this information for so long. And, and not just like, we didn't do it. Like these are like if you read the book Color of Law, you'll realize that there were government sanctioned laws that shut us out of this. You know, shut us out financially. Absolutely. And so now we have to take back control and re-educate it, people. Not it's that. dope because like from an education standpoint, right? And the same thing from the financial world. You're inside the system, Absolutely. right? So you can see that the customers and your clients really don't have knowledge. And the same thing that we're kind of doing where I'm in the education system. I know it's not being taught in school. So we have to go out and give the financial education. Sure. But one of the things that you said is that you're culturally responsive. Absolutely. And that is so powerful because, like I said, culture always changes, sure. right? Down to the, the name of your company, right? Mm -hmm. Money Right Management. Yeah, like, yeah. when I heard Money Right, automatically I thought Memphis Bleak. For sure. And when I was like, yo, is, is there something there? Yeah, no, absolutely, without a doubt. And it's so, so, it's so funny. And th this is a testament to why... You be your authentic self and right. do not care what people say. I'm gonna tell you tell you a quick story. I wrote my first book in 2009, right? It's going on 10 years. It was called Mind Right, Money Right, based on the Jay Z and Memphis Bleak song. Right. When I wrote the book, though, you know, I did not write the book as if the influence was hip hop, right? Like I tried to, you know, at the time you had the Dave Ramsey, Susie Ormonds out there, and people were advising me against using hip hop and money. They were like, yo. <laughs> It's, it's a serious topic. Do not blend the two. How can you possibly do it? And I listened to them. Yeah. And so I said, you know what? Nah, I'm going to write this book. I'm going to do it the way I want to write it, whatever the case may be. Fast forward, right, you, you know, eight years later where I finally was like, nah, I hear the Jay-Z 444 album. We're hearing it different. And I'm like, nah, <laughs> I got to mix hip hop and, and, and you know, and uh, finances together. And it became my most successful book. Okay. Had I listened yeah. 10 years ago and said, you know what, nah, I'm feeling this hip hop and money, I'm going to mix the two together. Uh, but to your point about being culturally responsive, it's that, right? Is that a lot of times, and this is not just uh, financial education, this is a lot of things that we're trying to teach people. 
we try we tend to teach people based on our level of understanding mm-hmm. but we don't realize or we we forget that we had to go through a journey to even get here right. and so as the educator let's stop trying to reach people from where we are but let's reach them where they are and i think that now that we look at hip hop as being the great equalizer where you know when, when i listened to my first jay z track i was 15 years old Right. And so throughout those years, I've grown. Right. People who listen to hip hop have grown. We have homes now. We have kids. We have families. You know, we have some even have grandchildren yeah. and are thinking about legacy building. Like we, yeah. we, the, we are the growing well, it's up like, It's like, it's like, it's right. like, um, right. Right. We, we, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like it's Eric Falcon. Derek Falcon. Derek Falcon, where he said, um, you know, we didn't know neo entrepreneurs, whereas we don't necessarily have to wear a suit if we don't want to. Right. We, can, right. we can wear Vapor Max and we can wear T-shirts. Yeah, the dude, the dude that doesn't, the that doesn't discredit. Right. The information. Absolutely. Right? Because it's like, okay, we grew up in the hip hop era. Yeah. We grew up playing sports and this, this is what it is, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, as opposed to trying to water it down, yep. be something that we're not, we can deliver the message in a language that the people understand. And that's what that's one thing I like about you because it's it's in line what we do mm-hmm. as far as with the podcast For is sure. like, you know, it's it's always easy to be yourself. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Like I, think, I think that's one of my favorite Drake lines. He, he, he said that line. He was like, you could be anything you want, even yourself. Right. Like, well, right. That's yeah, brilliant. I mean, even, even when <laughs> right. I, AZ, uh, when he said, um, still do me because it's easy to do. Because right. it's like, that really is easy. Like, you know <laughs> right. what I'm saying? It it's hard. It, it takes right. a lot of effort right. to try to be somebody that you're Absolutely. not. But yeah. a Absolutely. lot of times people do that every single day mm-hmm. in the work world and just life in general. And it, it, A, it never works because mm-hmm. you're trying to duplicate somebody else. Right. And B, it's just not even comfortable. Right. So the message is the message is never going to get delivered because the people that you're trying to be like, they know you're you're not them, right? Mm-hmm. And the right. people who you really are like, they looking at you like you're not even you right. you you talking down to like you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't sound like us. Right, <laughs> you right, turn, you right. turned your back on us. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you something because you said something that was very key. You said um, when you was on the institutional side working in banks, mm-hmm. you realized that like. Wealthy people, like they have a team, man. Right? And we even said, um, with Nip bringing it back with the lyrics, when Nipsey said, um, I don't need an ID in my bank, I walk in, I got a team in my bank. Yeah, right. And you was like, that's one of the things that motivates you to just educate people because, it's like, we're so far. When I say we, our community, yeah. we're so far behind the eight ball, we yeah. don't even know yeah. what's on the other side of the oh door. Oh my god! Like, can you just explain, like, what's on the other yeah. side of the man. door? Man, so, so, so for two years, right? I was a, a private banker and. Uh, I manage assets. I had a book of business, 400 mass affluent clients, right? So the, the term mass affluent just means $250,000 in investable assets, right? So you have to have liquid $250,000 or more to even qualify to have a private banker. Um, and so the, the, my, my richest client was worth $22 million. I was part of a team though. I wasn't like, I wasn't the, the only person that worked on that on that wealthy person's portfolio. You know, I I managed the, the the banks and the mutual funds, and there was somebody who was the mortgage guy. There was somebody who was the the banker. There was somebody who uh you know worked on you know the investment banking side. Like they had a whole team of people who not only worked for them, meaning that this wealthy person didn't have to think about their money. Like this wealthy person got up and did what they did every single day to keep their wealth. And there were people working around the clock to manage their money, to make sure that their money grows. Right. Meaning that from a from a banking perspective, there were no fees they, they weren't charged anything from an investment perspective. They had someone watching their portfolio, you know, from a mortgage perspective. They had somebody if, if rates drop would. So these were all people working proactively to to maintain or build this person's wealth while us. You know, people in our community, people who don't have access to this team, like we're ch- trying to figure out how to how to do stuff day to day. And we got to think about our money. We got to think about how to make the money. We yeah. got to think about how to manage the money. And so that's why when they say that term, you know, the, 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 the rich get richer is because they have a team. They have things and, and systems and processes in place that keep them at that level. And so for me, uh, you know, I, I'm a big Jay fan, so I'm going to quote Jay all day, right? You're in, you're in the right place. Right? So, so, so Jay said, there's much bigger issues in the world I know, but I but first, first had to take care of the world I know. Yep. And so for me, I'm like, yo, I'm from the I'm from the projects, B. I'm from uh, you, know, you see the the Harlem coming out, <laughs> right? I'm from the projects. I'm from 129th Street and Eighth Avenue, like old, old, old Harlem, the old Harlem, old Harlem, not, not right? the new Harlem, <laughs> old Harlem, right? And so, We're like a spoof, you know what I mean? 
So I'm from Ohio, so I understand what it's, what it's like to be from the bottom, but then I've done well for myself. So I un also understand that other side of it. And I'm like, nah, this ain't it. Like, my people need this, right? So there's much bigger issues. I could be doing so many other things, but I first had to take care of the world I know. And I think that, you know, for us, and this is why I appreciate what y'all do as well, yeah. is because we're credible messengers, right? Like, mm -hmm. you can't, like, I, yo, I've, I've, I've been to Rikers Island. And I've been in the corporate boardroom, right? Talking the same, it's the same language, yeah. and it's nothing nobody could tell me about this, B, because I've I've been on both sides, and I think that's what makes us credible because we got receipts. And I think that's important, right? Having those receipts, but reaching people at a level that they understand and hip hop, money, they, they're not they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. It, it's it's important because it's like we said this before. It's like the message is for everybody, for sure. but the people who need it. You know, yes. going to be impacted by it most are going to receive it. Sure, you know what I mean, and, sure. and that's something that we pride ourselves on, right? Because we, like you said, we are the messengers of this, sure. and we and we have receipts to prove it. Um, but you know what? It's interesting because that's great. It's people say that hip hop is not finance. Hip hop actually is finance. Yeah, yeah. Everything about it Absolutely. is money, right? Yeah. As far as the the lyrics, it's a business, a billion dollar business, yeah. and it always was about education at its core mm -hmm. was educating even if it's not educating you on the right thing you still right, get right. educated right. <laughs> like, right. you know what I'm saying right. there's a lot of nah, 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 because the thing, the thing sure. about sure. it is like even for me like you know I pride myself on having a, a very good memory but one of the things I think keeps my memory so good is I have so much rap lyrics that I remembered mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and like I said a lot of the things that I learned there from rap they weren't necessarily positive mm -hmm. but it was still an education right for sure so it's like now if we can teach people using lyrics yep. and music as something that they can relate to culturally, to me, that's a win-win. Yeah. That's a win-win. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I'm going to tie this all in with your books because that's actually what you do mm -hmm. as far as writing books. So in the next segment, we're going to talk about the journey from being employed to being a self-entrepreneur mm -hmm. um, and publisher of your books. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the whole journey as well because a lot of times people don't, A, fully understand the book industry, For sure. how it can be lucrative how they can publish a book themselves. They don't need Publisher. a major company to do it for them. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to go through the, the 101 on books. All right. So you're an entrepreneur. You do a lot of different things. But one of the things that you do is you're an author. Yes. And you wrote seven books? Seven books. Yeah. All right. So can we talk about that? We haven't covered the book industry yet. So um, what is the process of writing a book? Like as far as from the... Like, do you like? Yeah, can you just walk me through that? Do you have yeah. a, a ghostwriter? Do you yeah? yeah you actually sit down with, with this? Yeah. So, so, so I'm gonna tell you. So, so when I wrote my first book ten years ago, uh, it took me about eight, maybe eight nine months to put the book out because uh, I literally I had a BlackBerry at the time. I literally would like sit in my car and like write the book on my BlackBerry. Now, fast forward, I could I got done by the book in two months, maybe less than that. Um, because technology is the great equalizer for everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, um, the way that you write a book is, and this is what I would suggest to anybody, is to start with the end in mind. So, so before you even write a first chapter or anything, understand what is it that you want people to get out of this book. And now I need you to say, this is the end. This is what I want people to get. And then now work your way backwards, right? So if I want people to get the financial lessons that Jay Z taught in 444, that's the main thing. So when people are finished, they're gonna understand how to build generational wealth. And so how do I do that? So now I go backwards and I outline. I say, all right, so I'm gonna go from from self sufficiency to cooperative economics to generational wealth, right? And I'm gonna break down each of those into chapters. Now that I've broken that down into chapters, I'm gonna to go to each chapter and I'm gonna bullet point everything and say, these are the main things I wanna talk about in each different chapter and literally dictate the rest. Now you, you didn't, did you go to formal school for that? You studied literature nah. or this is just all given? All, all, all self-taught. So, so, he, so here's what I realized, and this is a, a great message as to um, you don't necessarily have to listen to people because they've done it or because they have a master's or whatever the case may be. Do what works for your audience, right? Mm -hmm. And what I realized was when I wrote my first book and then I started, then, you know, that one did pretty well. And then I wrote my second book, uh, which is What the FICO, 12 Steps of Repairing Your Credit. I realized that people liked that book because I wrote the way I talked. Mm -hmm. And the pe my audience didn't care about syntax. They didn't care about you know, you know, uh, and I don't want to say proper because at the end of the day, my goal 
was to get the message out to the people that I needed to get the message. And so what I what I decided to do was like, you know what, if people are, are resonating with my writing because they like it, you know, I write the way I talk, then that's why I started to dictate books. After I dictate the book, I then I do send it to an editor, right? Because I'm, you know. So I, with dictate, what is that? What, what's that mean? So like literally, I, I pull my iPhone out. And just record. I got a, yeah, I got an oh. MV88, and I literally. So now I got this outline, right? I have this outline. I know each of the chapters. So chapter one, you know, uh, you know, don't spend money on a V12 engine. And so <laughs> now, right? And so now I'm literally uh, uh, speaking into my phone as if I was teaching it, right? Yeah. And so as a public speaker. You know, if you tell me right now I need you to talk about a topic, I could get on my feet and talk about the topic. And so literally, I, I would just talk into the microphone and dictate what, you know, what I want people to, to learn from that chapter. Yeah. The great thing about technology is because you have, um, you know, you have, uh, um, uh, not apps, but you have services like Fiverr, right? You go to Fiverr and get somebody to translate, right, to, to transcribe what you just said into the written form. Ah. And so now you go to Fiverr, they transcribe it for you. Now you have a whole 10 pages that you just dictated in 20 minutes. Literally, in wow. 20 minutes. What's you the got cost? What's the cost for that? Maybe $100, maybe $200. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It depends on how, you know, how much time, right? Yeah. And so, you know, you get them to, to, to tr you know, to, to transcribe it for you. And then that, that, that way, now you have this book uh, written all raw form of how you talk. Yeah. You go through it first, though. Right. You go through it. You make sure it reads right. You you know, you may have to do some research. Like so for, for me, I had to research certain stories. Right. So if I'm talking about, you know, owning your rights and and Prince, I had to learn. I had to, I had to talk about Prince's story. And, you know, he didn't have a will. And, you know, what what he wanted to do with his things. And I need to add those things. So those pieces you add later, like the research and all that stuff you add later. But the main topic, your knowledge, what you want people to learn, you dictate that you go through the book. And literally, I think you could you could you could write and and publish a book, two to three months tops. And that's been the process from the first second book on, or no? So I, so I started this process. Um, so I, so I'm at I'm at seven books. Uh, book four to seven, I've dictated. So all right, so that's how you actually write the book. Yeah. Now the next step of actually publishing a book, mm -hmm. getting it out there. How, what's that? Yeah, so publishing the book is literally going through Amazon, right? And so, um, you know, Amazon used to have a company called Create Space, but they all kind of merged it now uh, into their their Kindle. Uh, Kindle. So if you go to Amazon.kdp.com, so it's like Kindle Direct Publishing is the name of the 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 company. Um, literally. Uh, you would go, so I use Fiverr again, right? Mm -hmm. So I get a book cover done. So can, my, can, can you explain what Fiverr is? I just heard that company, but can you explain that? Oh, uh, yeah. So Fiverr is a marketplace for uh, any service that you need, graphic designers, uh, anything you need. Even, like freelance Yeah, people. freelance people, right? And so um, the great thing about Fiverr is that Fiverr um, has freelancers from all over the world. Um, and so in someone in Indonesia who is a graphic designer is not going to charge you $1,000 for a book cover. Mm -hmm. They're literally going to charge you 10 to $15 or $20 or $30, something that we look at, oh, this is nothing. But for them, lot, you know, their of cost money. of living is so low. So that's a lot of money for them, yeah. right? Um, and so I use uh, Fiverr to create, to, you know, I use a graphic designer on Fiverr. I literally never paid more than fifty dollars for a book cover after I use Fiverr, and my book covers. If you if you go to Amazon right now, you look at all of my book covers. They all look professional. They're all done, you know, with top quality. But I'm paying fifty dollars for that. Yeah. Um, you also can go to Fiverr, right? So once you um, are you finish writing the book, you get somebody to edit the book for you. Uh, there's a layout design, right? So when you look at the book, the book has to be laid out somehow. I use Fiverr for that as well. I go to Fiverr. Wait, hold on. Let me stop giving them plugs. <laughs> we we not, might be some sponsorship dollars. Cut, yeah. cut the check. Cut the check. Cut the check, Fiverr. Yeah. Cut the check. So you can go to any, <laughs> but 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 you know, like you, you could you could literally, um, you know, get somebody to to design the inside of the book for you as well, yeah. um, and that's how you get the professional look, right? And so once you have your cover your cover file, you have your your inside file. Uh, you then upload that to Kindle Direct Publishing, um, and 
there's a couple of things that, that that happens with that, right? Number one, once you upload it, you write, you know, you you put your title in, you put the subtitle, you put your name, your bio, you put all that stuff in, and that's how it's going to be populated into Amazon.com and ready for sale. Um, the only sort of caveat to that is that uh, Kindle Direct Publishing will give you an ISBN number, right? And so your ISBN number is your is the the book where people search the book. It's your barcode. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you go through Amazon to get an ISBN number, uh, when you go to Amazon, it's going to show uh, Amazon. It's going to say you independently published this book, right? Or you can buy your own ISBN number, uh, which is if you go to Bowker's. So Bowker's uh, is the company that offers ISBN numbers, and that's what identifies your book. If you go to buy, uh, Bowker's, and, and I think the website is myidentifiers.com, you can actually buy your own ISBN number. Why is that important, right? It's important because for me, as a speaker, as somebody who, you know, my, my books are are how I teach the people, but it also is a, a, a way, uh, like a resume that lets me in so people could book me for speaking engagements, people book me for media, you know, media opportunities, things of that nature, which give me more visibility to sell more books. For some reason, there's still this negative taboo on self-published authors. And so if I use Amazon to, to, to give me my ISBN number, it's going to show that I'm independently published and people are not going to take me as serious. Serious. So what I do is I go to Bowker's and I buy my own ISBN number under my own company called One Brick Publishing. Mm -hmm. Right. So all of my books have been uh, distributed under One Brick Publishing. The reason why it's One Brick Publishing and it's not Ash Cash Publishing is because I want you to. I don't want you to be like, oh, Ash Cash. The same guy. It's, He's it's doing the same another guy. one. Right. He's, right? <laughs> it always looks better if it's a bigger entity. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So now people are like, yo, like I literally get people to hit me like, yo, can you connect me with one brick publisher? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right? Because it sounds dope. And honestly, yeah. you know, his, uh, one, one you brick publishing is because back in the days, I used to move those bricks. Like, oh, <laughs> one, one brick publishing was, a, was one, one brick was, at a time. One brick at a time. So that, that's where, that, that's where, that's where it, I, I got it from, actually. I was watching a Will Smith story, and Will Smith was giving his example of about how him and his brother got, you know, his pops tore down his wall and told him to rebuild the wall. And they were looking like, yo, how I'm gonna rebuild the wall? They said, yo, build it one brick at a time. And if yeah. you make sure that this is the best brick possible, then you'll have a good wall. So I was like, oh, that's a dope story. Then that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna build a publishing company yeah. one brick at a time. And so now when you look at my books, they're all published by one brick. Um, and the reason why that's important because now when people are looking for somebody, they're looking for experts, they're looking for people, uh, they're gonna see, Everything you know, everything's professional. You, it, it, it gives this uh, you know illusion um, that you're signed to a publishing yeah. house, um, and and people will take you more serious from that. Now that's dope. That's I, well, before I just want to um, yo earn your leisure, man. We give out a lot of <laughs> nah, facts. free game, <laughs> facts. man. Like yo, honestly. We might have to start charging for I'm this. Like, this myself, is, man. Nah, it's like, a little, it's a little different, man. It's, nah, it's getting crazy. It's getting I, crazy. So you have you haven't done an audio book yet, right? So uh, absolutely. Oh, you haven't. I, yo, I so eat off of books. So is it the same process? Like, so if I you do it through. The, I'm not going to say the company's name. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? You send it to an editor. Yep. Now they tell you what you need to say and you do it through the audio. No, nah, so 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 the way I do the audios, um, and that was a that was another thing, right? So I was like, so I make a, I make a living off of books, though. You know what I'm saying? Right. And what I realized was. That, you know, and, and it happened, and, and I went backwards because when I put out the J book, the 444 book, yo, I had Uber drivers. Like, yo, bro, I need this book, but I'm in my Uber all day. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. Yeah, and so I kept forgetting about a market of people who either drive, who that's don't like, have time. That's like me. That's yeah, like me. Yeah, right. Yeah, they yeah, cannot yeah. pick up a physical book. Yeah. Um, and so literally, like... Fast shout out to Garage Band. Like I literally recorded my audio books. Uh, shout out to Garage Band. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Like I literally, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like recorded my books on Garage Band. Um, once the you know, I, I, and I like I read the book. So I'm literally like reading the book. Once it's done, um, even if I mess up or whatever the case may be to get get everything right. I send it to somebody on on that company again, yeah. um, and you can look for you know you know audio edits or whatever the case may be. Uh, they edit it. They they even take out the dead air. So like like sometimes if if, if it doesn't yeah. sound right yeah. and there's dead air, they take they like they edit it, compress it. Um, I mean you you know you listen to it all um, freelance, right? 
Yeah, all freelance? freelance. Oh, yeah, all these people are freelance. Okay. Um, and then there's a company called ACX. It's all owned by Amazon. Amazon run things. So <laughs> they, 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 yeah, they run things. <laughs> so ACX, right? A A C X dot com. Uh, if you go to them now, you upload your file, you put the title and all that stuff, um, and then they distribute the book to Audible dot com and iTunes. Mm. And so now, if you look look for my book on audio. You'll see it on Audible. You'll see it on iTunes, and that's how, how I do audio books. They do it for free. Uh, yeah. So, so the so the thing about um, Amazon and ACX and all these people, it's print on demand, right? Um, which means that it's all consignment. So it's not like you don't have to pay anything. They just take a percentage of what's being sold. Mm. Right. I, I was going to ask you that because somebody else um, shot my man um, IMPOP Steve Pop, Lewis what up? Jr. Yeah, he he wrote a book. And that's I, my guy too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 Pop, yeah. Pop. I, I spoke to him Pop. and he was saying that, um, like you said, because I was asking him, like. What if you have like a thousand books yeah. and they're not selling? He was like, well, they only print the books right. as you want it. Right. Or if you go into a show, you can have like a hundred books, but until then it's ordered. And then when they actually order it, then they'll print it. Can you explain right. that process? Yeah. So it's so it's the dopest thing. And that's why I think, and, and there's it's two different business models, right? I'm not of the thinking that one is better than the other. Do what works for you, right? Because we all know uh, Eric Thomas, the, the, the hip-hop preacher. Yeah. When, when he came out with his book, he did not put it on Amazon, right? He sold them straight out of his garage. He mm. did all of that, right? And, you know, obviously you keep the lion's share. But if, if, if you have the capital up front to do that, to buy the books and do all that stuff, then that's fine. Or if you have the... Um, you know, if, if people are, are, are reaching out to you, right, you have the demand, then that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But if somebody's just starting out, I literally, right, like I can literally put out a book for less than $500, right? Because all I'm telling you is that I, all I need is the person to do the cover for me, I need an editor, and I need somebody to do the design for me, and then now I have the book out. What happens is I set the price, right? So let's say I want I want to charge, you know, I want to charge $14.99 for my books. I put it out on Amazon for $14.99, and so, so, so I don't have to pay anything at all. Every time somebody orders a book, Amazon, uh, they take care of the printing. And so they minus the printing cost. And so, you know, a book like this, you know, it's probably, probably cost you about $2.50 to print. And so they take out that $2.50 from that $14.99. Mm -hmm. And then just to have uh, put it on their platform, they might take 20 to 40% of that. Okay. And then you get the difference. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it works where you can sell a thousand books, but you don't ever have to worry about yeah. keeping, you know, you know, uh, inventory in your trunk or anything like that. I mean, for me as a speaker, and that's the great thing about it, too, is that, you know, when I when, when people buy books on Amazon, I, I get a I get a check from them each month. Right. At the end of the month. But, but when I do speaking engagements, I'm not you know, I'm I'm ordering my books from them. And think about it. If I print out this book and it costs me two dollars and fifty cent, I'm selling it to you hand in hand ten dollars. Mm. So I'm still making seven dollars and fifty cent, and I had to put up no, you know, yeah. like I had to put up the two fifty up front to get it. But I already know, oh, I'm about to go to the speaking engagement, or you know, I'm about to speak at this school, and the school wants X amount of copies, and so. It's really a low overhead way to make money um, by not having to keep that keep a lot of a lot of the, the revenue or, or inventory in, in, in your trunk, you know, in your garage. Because I remember my first book, I, like those books were collecting dust. I was like hype, you know. I put the money out up front. Yeah, I'm like, Yo, let me get a thousand copies. <laughs> I'm thinking that they're gonna sell out, and yeah. I'm just sitting there looking at these like blowing dust off of them. You yeah, know what I'm saying? We got, we got. I mean, it's pretty similar to us. Like a lot of times, we go places and people ask us, like, "Yo, what, can I get a shirt? Can yep. I get a shirt?" And yep. we're like. But well, we really don't carry the shirts, right? right? They, we, we got a, a company that you order them online. Like right. You go to our website, you can get them. Right. We don't walk around with inventory, right? Because right. like, who wants to be stuck with exactly. 500 shirts exactly. and 10 cells? Right. You know and pu exactly. Putting out that upfront capital right. and then having to wait or hustle your way to yeah. get rid of that inventory opposed to just saying, you know what? If the demand is there, let me put it out there. Exactly. And if the, if the demand is there, it's a win-win for everybody. And that's why I like that, that business model. Yeah, that's dope. And all right, so for independent authors, um, how does that work as far as different? Like, if you sign to a major publication, like um, Simon Schuster, I think yeah, that, that that's top, like, yep, yep. it's like I think Charlemagne, because he actually Charlemagne, he spoke about that where he he signed to Charlemagne Schuster, and um, he did the book Black Privilege. Mm. Then I think he did another book, um, oh, Shook Ones, Shook yeah, Ones. Yep. and he was saying he was like, you know what. I should have just did this myself. And he would have killed it. He did it so, like, what's the dip? Like, is it like a record deal? Like, they take exactly. A it's exactly like. Oh, is it? It's exactly like a record <laughs> deal. So, so pretty much, 
That's exactly like a record deal. Pretty much, Simon & Schuster says, oh, you hot right now? All right, I'm going to put out this book, and I'm going to give you points off the book. Right. And so if I sell the book for ten dollars, I'll give you a dot like and their numbers are like it's so archaic. Like their numbers are probably still that. Right. If they sell a book for ten dollars, you probably still only get one dollar off of every book you sell. Right. And he has two number one bestsellers. Exactly. And so what happens is, you know, they they they, they definitely gave him an advance because of who he, who he is. is. Right, right, right. Right. So so what happens is they but they give him this advance, they say, here's this money up front. And then whatever we sell, you get, you know, like we deduct that from the advance and you'll you'll get royalties forever. Right. You'll get a dollar off of every book you sell forever. Mm -hmm. But who gets that nine dollars? Right. It's Simon and Schuster. Right. Um, he's a big enough name that if he self-published the book himself, he would have kept the lion's share of that. And that's why I love being a self-published author. Right. Because that's exactly that. When I first wrote my book, I knew that I had direct access to my consumer through Twitter and then Instagram came and then Facebook to the point, and I'm not even done yet. Like I haven't even hit the height of where I know I'll be, but imagine that, right? The, the moment where millions of people know that Ash Cash teaches financial education and people say, wow, he got these books. I want to learn about credit. Where can I go? I want to learn about this. And they go and get all these books. Mm -hmm. I eat off that forever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They go back and, to and, but the intellectual property, like you said, too off camera is like, that's something that stays in, that's a catalog, like music. Absolutely. So we talk about like, even with Nipsey, a lot of people just got up on Nipsey last year with his last album, but he had a body of work mixtapes before that. Yep. So when they heard Victory Lap, they were so impressed with it. And it's like, okay, let me go back to Bullets Ain't Got No Names On It and all the other yeah. stuff that he did early on. Yeah. But you already have that music. Since, like, even Chris Gotti said that on our interview with him when he was like, once the music is dead, it should be there forever. Because right. DMX is still going to make money if somebody buys It's Dark and Hell is High. Exactly. Yeah, Even exactly. though it came out 15 years exactly. ago. It's like, exactly. it's like They had uh, Wall Street Journal actually published this article on Slick Rick mm -hmm. and how Lottie Dottie is the most sampled song in the history of hip-hop. Mm -hmm. And he still makes money off it. Yep. But not as much as he could have, right, right. but he still is. You know what Yo, I'm saying? think about this. And I think I, I, I want to say I wrote it in, in, in the 444 book. I talk about Whitney Houston, right? When Bodyguard came out, uh, I will always love you. Her biggest record ever. Right. Dolly Parton wrote it. Yeah. She made the least amount of money from it. Whitney Houston made the least amount of money from it. Dolly Parton. It's a sample. Or she wrote. It's she her wrote song. This, it's her, her song. song. It's her song. It's, I, I think she it's, actually it's, performed it before yeah. too. It's a remake. A of remake that. of the song. Right. Right. And and so she so so. You know, now Whitney Houston, you know, crossed over. She has this movie with Kevin Costner yeah. and all these people are like, oh my God, I will always love you. I think <laughs> I think it's so 42 million. Yeah, yeah. the crazy number. And she had, I mean, thankfully for her, she had like three other number ones off that right, soundtrack, sure, but sure. the biggest one was I Will Always Love You. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so and so the point is, as as the honorable Sean Carter says, <laughs> until you <laughs> own your own, known. right? <laughs> until you own your own, you can't be free. Can't it's be about free. it's yeah. about ownership. Yeah. And you know, again. You have to believe in yourself, right? And a lot of times people are going to say, yo, you know what? I'm going to take it. I mean, it, you know, sometimes people will sell their intellectual property because they want to foot in the door. They want to do certain things. But if you believe that your information is, is gold, if you believe or if somebody else believes and they're willing to pay you for it, sometimes waiting it out, right? Like Master P said. Master P was like, yo, they, when, once they offered me a million dollars, I realized. I knew. I knew. I was worth more. <laughs> I was worth more. You know what I'm saying? And so because of that, he held out. And that's why he made so much money. And so we have to be an of that mindset and that's what you know i like to teach and that's what we're teaching is ownership is key because that that is that is your you know that's your income that's your legacy that's what you could pass down you can't pass all right all right great if you get this royalty from another company they're like they they were not they they did not write the book they did not they did not write the verse why are they getting the most of it why why why, why am i signed to you right Yes, if you have the distribution channel, then we should partner. We should make money together. Mm -hmm. But why, but why am I only getting ten percent? And and yeah, you got costs associated with it, but you're still making more than me. And it's my name, my likeness, my information, my music, my whatever. And now you're you're able to profit the most of it. It doesn't make sense. Gems, a lot of gems, yeah, a lot yeah. of gems right there. All right, so now we we got the whole book industry under wraps. So now we're gonna go into some some tips for everyday people. All right, so in the last segment, we're going to talk about some financial tips yeah. for everyday people, right? We're going to try to give a few gems that people can use in their day-to-day -day life because a lot of times, as you said, we don't know, mm -hmm. and it's an ongoing learning process, right? So one of the things I want to talk about is that we covered credit and the yeah. importance of credit, and I know you have a credit company, right? Yeah, for sure. 
Um, but I, I got a question at DM where somebody says, like, what's the best way to pay off your debt? Mm-hmm. Like, I know some people have a process where they pay off the higher interest credit cards first. Some people do the lowest balances first. Yeah. Like, what's your philosophy on that? Yeah, so so I so I like I like the 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 lowest balance philosophy. Um, and so I wrote a book called, you know, uh, what the FICO 12 the steps FICO. to pay your credit. Right. Yeah. Um, and I talk about the, the snowball is what is what it's, what it's called. Um, and, but, but, but the reason though, right. The reason why the philosophy on taking your lowest balance and paying that off first is important is because you want some small wins, right? It's the mindset. I've seen people who try to say, all right, you know what? Uh, this credit card is charging me the highest interest rate, and so I'm going to pay that one first. And then they they're paying the minimums, and they're trying to pay that off. And they wind up w- looking at their uh, credit card balances each month, and it looks like nothing is going anywhere. They get discouraged. They wind up doing something else uh, because they don't see any forward motion. Um, the best way to pay down credit card debt is it will always be to take all of your credit card your credit cards. Put them in order from smallest to largest balance. Make sure that you pay off the minimums on all of the cards. And but it's going to start with a, with, with, with a budget, right? You're going to have to budget a, a certain amount. You're going to say, you know what? I'm going to budget four hundred dollars each month towards debt. Pay the minimums on all of the cards, and whatever's left over from that four hundred dollars, you're going to take that money and you're going to pay off the lo- the lowest amount completely. Right. The following month, you do the same thing. You take the lowest amount, you pay the minimums and then whatever's left over, you snowball that amount to the next one. You keep doing that until you get this one account. That's your biggest account. And now you take that four hundred dollars and you tackle it. You keep tackling, you keep tackling it. And then eventually you'll realize that you'll be debt free. Uh, That works because it motivates you. Right. If you have a credit card that has two hundred dollars on it and you went from having five cards to four cards, Mm -hmm. uh, you see like, oh, wow, I see the result. I saw that I that if I stay focused, I, you know, I, I cut down this one balance. Then the next month, you know, that card that has five hundred dollars, it takes you two months to pay that off. Then that's that. Those are those small wins. And psychologically, it gives you the, the you know, the, the motivation to keep going. At the, at the same time, when you're, you're chopping them down, you're decreasing the utilization rate. Absolutely. Right? So we're trying to keep that under 30 percent. Under 30 so. percent. And, and, and I think what people people love that 30 percent number. Yeah. But the fact of the matter too is that so your credit goes three hundred to eight fifty. Anything over seven twenty is excellent credit. Those who have a seven twenty or above actually keep their utilization between ten to fifteen percent, even lower, even lower, right, right? right? Because the the mindset or the way the FICO algorithm works is that it it rewards people who who don't seem as if they need credit. Right. So 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 the so the more yeah. it looks like you need credit, the more they'll lower your score. That, that, that's a fact because actually I just I haven't checked my credit in a long time. I just checked it, and it was a seven eighty, and um, at fifteen percent yep. utilization rate, yeah. exactly that yeah. same number yeah. in seven eighty. So yeah. you, if you think about it, right, if I got a hundred dollar card yep. and I'm paying ninety dollars, right, right, that seems affordable, right? But if I got a five thousand dollar debt and I'm paying ninety, it don't you don't feel it exactly. It's like, you know what I'm saying? They're gonna take interest on that. Now you really only paid. Fifty dollars, right? It doesn't. It doesn't feel the same. But let right. me ask you this. Um, let me ask you this though. So let's say you have ten credit cards, right? Mm-hmm. You pay off all ten yeah. in full. Now you only start using one on a regular basis. You're not using the other nine. Mm-hmm. Does that hurt you? No, it doesn't. So, so y- yes and no, right? So what happens is this: is that your utilization ratio is an aggregate of all the cards that you have, right? And so if you have you know, uh, 10 cards, you're not using the other nine and you're only using the one, um, it's going to help you because that one card is, is, is a small percentage of your total utilization. But what happens is if you're not using the other nine cards and the credit card companies realize that, you know what, this person's not using the card, so I'm going to close this account. Then as they close the account, that hurts, that hurts you yeah. because now 15% of your score is based on your length of credit history. And so one of those cards might have been a card that you had for a long time, which was helping your score. And once that card is closed, it negatively impacts you. Plus, you, you you lose that utilization, right? Because now that credit limit is no longer available so that your utilization ratio is going to go up once they close those cards, right? right? And so it's, it, it definitely is... Um, Sort of like a game, like if you have that many credit cards, um, a lot of times I like to say if you want, like if credit matters, right? If credit doesn't matter, like if you're not going to buy anything in the, in the short term, then, you know, I wouldn't 
put stuff on your credit cards just to keep this number up, right? Mm -hmm. But if credit matters or if you're going to buy something or whatever the case may be and you need credit, I would say you know, use your cre some, some credit cards for things that you would have paid cash for anyway, right? And so if, let's say, for instance, uh, you use cash to buy gas, right? Use a credit card and that money that you would have, you know, paid or, or that money you would have used to buy the gas, pay off the card with that. So that way there's at least some activity on it so the credit card companies don't close. Let me ask you this also. Let's say you get, because they got all kinds of credit cards now. They got cards for like medical purposes, mm -hmm. right? So let's say you have, a low utilization rate, but you get one card for a medical purpose and you you, you max that card out. Yeah. But your other utilization is good, but you max that one card out. Mm -hmm. That hurts you? It doesn't because it's the aggregate, yeah. right? Okay, okay. And so if you, let's say you had 10 cards with $1,000, right? And you max out one card at $1,000, your your utilization is still only 10%, right? right? Because your total available limit is 10,000 when you look at all the cards. And so that's what I was saying where- When you close it, it, it Yeah, goes, when you close it, it, it can hurt you. Because if, if now, if you max out at, at, at $1,000, and let's say the nine cards say, you know what, he ain't using these cards, so let me close these out. Now your utilization go from 10% to 100%, and that's going to immediately you know, dive your, dive yeah, your credit that, That's a smart strategy, though, right? If you have 10 cards, maybe you have 10 different purposes. So if it's sure. a supermarket, or if it's gas, sure. or if it's you know electronics or something like that, like you have a purpose for each one. For not sure. just like, I'm randomly, all right, that one's max, let me go to the next, you know what I'm saying? Make a purpose for each card. Yeah, because 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 cre credit card debt is the worst type of debt that you could possibly have, right? Like credit card debt, you're paying more than what it's worth. So and student loan. Yeah, and student loan. <laughs> I mean, but but even, but even with student loans, you know, you know, uh, at least with student loans, you get a degree. You know, you're able to like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm not a, you know, because I I didn't get a degree till later on in life. So I'm, you know, I can go either way with student loans. Yeah, me too. Man. But credit cards are like. Is is there's no reason why you should be paying credit card debt? You know what I'm saying? All right, that's good information. Very good information. So let's go um, retirement plan. Yes. Right. People, will ask another question I got in the DM. Um, okay. So 401k. Yeah. IRA, Roth IRA. Can we start with the 401k? Why is it a good idea for people to put money into a 401k? Man, so the 401k is is, is like free money. So so first of all, is this right? Is that when you think about your um, the money that you pay to the IRS? Uh, when you put money into a retirement account, it lowers you, you know, what you have to pay to them because uh, part of that money is na is now tax is not tax deductible, right? Or you, you don't pay taxes on that money, right? And so putting your money in a four hundred one k allows you to say, you know what, uh, in the future I'll have this money to retire off, but I don't have to pay taxes on it right now, right? But also, a lot of employers will match your 401k. So mm -hmm. they might they might match you up to 4%, which means that if, or 4%, 6%, 4% has been sort of like the industry norm that I've heard. And so if a job says, if you, they want to encourage you to save for retirement. So they say, if you put, whatever you put in, we're going we're gonna to match it up to 4%, which means that 4% is free money. And as long as you're vested, they they might they might have a stipulation. All right, you have to be with a with our company five years or whatever the case may be. You keep that money, and so not investing in a four hundred one k, you're actually losing money, free money that the employer would have given you. And so uh, you know, so that's one reason. But then when you think about a uh, retirement just as a whole, social security might not be here for us. Right. And so by the time you know we become of age and it's time to retire. There's going to be a certain number that you're going to need each month to live off of, and you're going to want to have an account that will be able to supply some of that that income, so that you you don't have to be 60, 70 working at Walmart. So, in, in the terms of people who come from the education field, obviously, I mean, I speak to teachers all the time, mm -hmm. and yes, they educate our children, but they have no idea about finance. Sure. So, we don't have a 401k; we have a 403b. Yeah. Same thing? Same, same exact thing, right? Because the importance of that, especially, you know, someone that works in the education field is that you want to make sure that you're not going to be able to teach forever. And then when, when it's time for you to, 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 to leave that, you know, that institution, you want to be able to have money coming in. You want to diversify your income. And so putting, putting that money out up front is going to allow it to, to grow. And if you find, right, so, so, you know, a lot of people are like weary, you know, especially when you think about the, the Bernie Madoffs and what happened in the, you know, the Great Recession 2008, 2009, people are like leery of, you know, putting their money in the markets. But 
if you remove that isolated incident out, mm-hmm. on, on average, you know, you know, uh, when you look at the stock market, markets are, you know, it, it, it's always positive, right? And so just kind of uh, keep an eye out on where your money's being invested. But that money is also going to, it's not like the money that you put in is just not going to stay at the amount that you put in. Mm-hmm. You're actually going to earn interest on that. And that money is going to grow through compound interest. So that way, you know, what you start off with is going to give you a nice little cushion for you know, for you when you retire. Yeah, Absolutely. and also the the Roth is another great way to yeah, save I love as well. The Roth. Yeah, yeah. That's the way where you you, you don't pay t- you you don't save money on taxes today, but it's tax free later on. Absolutely. Right? So- and, and 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 honestly, I like that better, right? Because what happens is this: um, you know, tax deductible means that you know uh, I can deduct this amount. If I put if I put ten thousand dollars, or let's say I put five thousand dollars towards my retirement. Uh, and I made forty five thousand dollars. Then I'm only I could deduct that five thousand off my taxes. I'm paying forty thousand in taxes. But then now that five thousand that I put, when it grows to a hundred thousand when I retire, you know I now need to pay taxes as I w- withdraw that money, right? Mm-hmm. And so and so it's it's you know it's tax deductible, but you pay taxes later. And the th- whole thought process is that when I get older, I'll have lower a lower tax burden. And so that so that that works that way, but. With the Roth, I love the Roth because it's not tax deductible, but it's tax-free distribution, right? Which means, all right, great. I put five thousand dollars into this into this Roth IRA this year. I made forty-five thousand dollars. I'm gonna pay forty-five thousand in taxes, right? But now that five thousand, when it grows to hundred thousand, and, and, and I could withdraw it tax-free. I never have to owe the IRS anything on that money, on that on that growth of that money. Um, it's you know I love that especially for young people. Maybe if you're a little older, um, you know it, it may not necessarily be the right thing to do. But the reason why I love it for young people is because you know right now as as, as a young person who has more you know uh, more earning ability, you could take you know bigger risk. Mm-hmm. And if you take that money that's in a Roth and you put it into something that is giving you a great rate of return, all of that growth you don't have to pay taxes on. Yes. Yeah. Somebody said one time, they said, um, if, if you, if you did, if you were never told the information, you can't be held responsible. Mm-hmm. If you were told the information and just chose not to do anything with that's on you. Absolutely. Right? I agree. So you can never say you weren't told the yes. information. People. Yes. <laughs> the application is up to you. Right. Right. The application part right. is up to you. <laughs> we try and give you as much information as we can give you, but ultimately you have to apply it. Yeah. So speaking about applied information, can you talk about the Money Right Legacy program? Yeah. So I so I started a Mind Right Legacy program, um, and you can visit mindrightlegacy.com to see what the program's about. Uh, but pretty much when I was working as a as a private banker, we talked about this, right? that they had a team, they had the tools, they had the resources, wealthy people to maintain and grow their wealth. And I realized that, yes, it's cool that I'm giving out this information, but what ways can I help people uh, create wealth for themselves as well? And so with the Mind Right Legacy program, it's, it's literally a 12-step program that I create uh, that I created that gives you 12 steps of financial freedom. So everything from how to budget, manage your credit, uh, creating multiple streams of income, you know, estate planning, oh, everything that you would need to create financial freedom. But then also uh, it comes with an app that allows you to see what your net worth is, right? Because I think that people need to understand that just because you make money doesn't mean that uh, you are net worth positive, right? And your net worth is literally your assets minus your liability. Like what do you actually own, right? Like after you pay off everybody, what is it, what's yours? Um, and so my program um, allows you to see in real time. So you could connect all of your bank accounts. You could uh, look at all of your debt and it gives you real time to say, okay, you know, I owe a uh, hundred thousand dollars in debt. I currently own an asset 200,000. So I have a hundred thousand or it might be negative, right? A lot of people who, who, who I work with now, they start off at a place where they have a student loan debt, they have you know mortgages or whatever the case may be, and they don't have that much assets. But now they're able to see, okay, let me set these goals for myself, and now I'm gonna work on eliminating debt and increasing my assets. And they ha- they get access to me as a financial coach. We do live you know live seminars. Um, it's really a, an affordable program for anybody who's serious about creating financial freedom, not living paycheck to paycheck. Getting, getting rid of debt, and then, and most important, leaving a legacy for their loved ones. 
financial freedom is our only hope. That's only it. hope. That's it. Only nah, hope. We want, we want to thank you for coming in. Nah, I appreciate you, brother. A lot of wisdom. A lot of wisdom, man. I hope everybody, you got to listen to it like three different times and, and have your yeah, notebooks ready. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. In every segment. But um, how can the people contact you? How can they get information on the program? How can they... Um, yeah, all, all your social media handles and all that. Nah, for sure. So the easiest way is my website, IamAshCash.com. Everything is there from, you know, my story, the my, my Mind Right Legacy program, everything. You can contact me through there. But then also hit me up on social media. Um, everything is I am Ash Cash, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Very responsive. You know, I work for the people, you know. So, so, I, so you know, for me, it's about uh, giving that information out. So if you have any questions, anything, just hit me up. Nah, for sure. For sure um, Troy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we brought up NIP, and uh, we're going to talk about Patreon.com, and it's growing. You know, it's like a proud-to-pay program where if you want to support the podcast, you can. There's five different tiers. And last, I think last time we spoke, we had like 35, and this week we got 10 new members. So I'm just going to give them a shout-out, Danita and uh, Diad, Crystal, Daniel, Sheena, and Rez. Rez is a day one. He's uh, from our hometown, so shout oh, out to Reg. Shout out to Reg. No, sure. I, I, I think I know Reg. I hit Reg up. Like yeah. he hit me. He was like he sent me one of y'all things. Oh, okay, okay. And oh, I was yeah. like, "Yo, I'm about to be on their show." He was like, "Yeah, I grew up with them." Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Reg. Shout out to Reg. For sure. Shout out to Reg. Yeah, yeah. So Patreon.com backslash Earn Your Leisure. Um, feel free to join. And uh, like I said, we got bonus content up there. We get the the audio edited free um, up there. And um, our website too, uh, EarnYourLeisure.com for the merch. Like you said, like it's on demand. So if you want the merch. Is there um, and continue support? Yeah, somebody it was a dope story. Somebody on Instagram, they like, yo, what's your cash app? They like, um, cause uh, you gave me information on the app. They're like, I just give them two free information. I gotta just send yeah, you something. Yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. it. Just off the strip, I just send you something. So, cash app is dollar sign earn your leisure. If anybody <laughs> wants to know, but yeah, that was dope. So yeah, um, Patreon, as you said, that's just a way to financially support the podcast, and um, you know, it takes money to run a podcast, so that's what we use it for. And then we go into Atlanta. We we can. Uh, we're looking forward to that. Can't say that enough. Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta. We are coming in two yeah. days. I'm um, looking forward to it. When you see us around the city, show us some love. Let yeah. us know where to eat at. You know what's going on. You know, we, yeah. we connect every with city, some people who you want us to hear. Yeah, you know for sure. That too. That too. And every 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 city we go to, we try to just tap in with the people and um, really, you know, check out the vibes and see what's going on. So we're looking forward to it. But before we go, we do a book tip every week. So being that you're an author, I'm gonna let you give the book tip on your books. All of your books, with your newest book, your new book coming out, whatever you guys say. So the floor is yours for the book tip. Nah, for sure. So, I, so, I, so you know, definitely, you know, we talked about Nipsey. Um, you know, I have the 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 new book uh, coming out called Hustle Nomics, uh, which is coming out on his birthday, August fifteenth. It's actually gonna be a free ebook, right? And so, you know, go go to Amazon.com, look at Hustle Nomics, um, and really, it's a blueprint. You know, you know, they they say the the reason why he called. Uh, you know, his, 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 his journey, the marathon uh, is because, right, when you think about a marathon, a marathon always continues, right? You, you pass the baton to somebody else. And so really, uh, this is the blueprint to financial independence, the blueprint of owning your own, the blueprint of, you know, you know, uh, continuing the legacy. So definitely, you know, check out the book. Um, but, you know, if you also check out the wake up call, Financial lessons learned from 444. Yeah, people, you know, sure. uh, based on on Jay Z's uh, album. Yeah. Uh, and this I is, said we we going to teach a course. Man, no, we, we have to. We, we, we going to do it, bro. He deserves podcast one. Jay needs one. No, we no, do absolutely, it. absolutely. And so this book right here uh, gives you a step by step guide on how to implement everything they talked about on the album. Um, and and again, I said this. I said this. I said this earlier. But until you own your own, you can't be free. And that's the message in in the wake up call. That's the message in hustle nomics. It's about ownership. Think about everybody who built wealth, right? Jay just crossed it. I know, I know we, we over, but <laughs> uh, Jay just crossed the billion dollar mark. Yeah. Look at all of the things that he did to cross that billion dollar mark. All of it is ownership. Ownership in businesses. Mm -hmm. Music was a small percentage of it. It's about ownership. I came into the game with more money than Puff. That's it. Then I realized Puff, Puff money, ain't, money enough. ain't enough. That's it. <laughs> shout out to Puff. Shout out to Puff. Shout out to Puff. Puff. <laughs> Call him, baby. My full Puff. <laughs> All right, y'all. Thank you for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace.